Before introducing our speaker this evening, let me thank John and Laurie Reinsberg, whose generous gift established this lecture series. John, an alumnus of the college, who is now deputy chairman of Lazard Asset Management, wanted Penn students to learn from those working in the international arena in positions that we might now call social impact. And he and his wife, Laurie, established this series. And Laurie is also very involved at Penn, and she's on the board of the Institute for Contemporary Art. I think that you will agree that this evening's speaker demonstrably fulfills John and Laurie's purpose. Our speaker this evening decided that he did not want to stand up in front of you and deliver the conventional lecture. You know, this is midterm week, and perhaps he thinks that at this point in the semester, most students don't want to listen to another lecture. So we're having a moderated discussion. And he suggested this moderated discussion, and we are fortunate this evening to have Professor Howard Pack of Wharton's Business and Public Policy Department to join us to moderate. Professor Pack is an expert in international and developmental economics. And by the way, he was uh, Bob Zellick's teacher at one point in the past. It's my great pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Mr. Robert B. Zellick, president of the World Bank Group, who, and there was a title, who will speak about the impact of the economic crisis on developing countries, but I do think the discussion may range broadly. When we asked Mr. Zellick to speak, we knew that there was a financial crisis. This was a month ago we asked him to speak, and we knew this. But now we realize that this crisis is much more far-reaching. In an article published in the Financial Times two weeks ago, Mr. Zellick was quoted as asking, what started as a financial crisis became an economic crisis and is now becoming an unemployment crisis, and to what degree does it become a human and social crisis? He then observed that this stark question should occupy the minds of all those struggling to find answers to the global recession. Mr. Zellick is superbly qualified to discuss possible answers to this question. Let me note some of the highlights of his long career in public service. He became the 11th president of the World Bank Group on July 1, 2007. Immediately prior to joining the bank, Mr. Zellick served as vice chairman international of the Goldman Sachs Group. He served in President George W. Bush's cabinet as the 13th U.S. Trade Representative from 2001 to 2005, and as Deputy Secretary of State from 2005 to 2006. From 1985 to 1993, he served at the Treasury and State Departments, as well as briefly in the White House. During the 1990s, Mr. Zellick served as an Executive Vice President of Fannie Mae. Mr. Zellick is no stranger to Philadelphia. He received his bachelor's degree from Swarthmore College, where he was Phi Beta Kappa. Um, he then went further north along the coast and spent some time at Cambridge. He received his JD magna cum laude from the Harvard Law School and his master's of public policy from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Robert Zellick, president of the World Bank. Okay, so what I'm going to start with is a set of questions which will allow us to get the discussion going. And the first thing is that when uh, you became president of the World Bank, the big challenges all of 18 months ago were you're going to list some of the newly emerging uh, economies to become partners in, uh, with the World Bank in fostering development throughout the world. You're going to encourage growth in the Middle East you're going to try to deal with fragile states emerging from civil war and disaster, use free trade to spur growth, 
and in general build sustainable and inclusive globalization. And now that you face a crisis every morning and probably every night, and uh, the world has changed quite dramatically, especially in the last six months, can you in retrospect say uh, that the topics you chose to emphasize when you first came in still remain important? Are they doable? And is it uh, feasible to address them given the crises that are occurring on a daily basis? Um, well, well, first, let, let me thank all of you for, uh, for joining us tonight, and uh, particularly since, as you mentioned, it's the heart of the midterms. But let this be a caution to you. Um, uh, professor Prack was my professor. He's still asking me questions, so you never get away from it. Uh, it's best just to give up and accept the role of the faculty. <laughs> Uh, what, what, what Howard had mentioned were, was that when I joined the World Bank, I thought it was very important to identify some strategic themes. And I talked about them uh, as themes because I was trying to recognize that the development mission of the bank um, had to customize its services for different challenges. And so we were focusing on uh, the poorest countries in Africa, the particular challenges of some of the middle-income countries and the rising uh, uh, economic powers, the unique issues of fragile states, uh, which uh, really require a combination of governance and security and development, um, global public goods, uh, which included the trade issue but also uh, climate change questions. I also highlighted uh, the Arab world and the Middle East because I thought there were some unique issues there that we could make a contribution. But another one which cuts across was a knowledge and learning agenda. And the reason I drew that out is because I think one of the key functions of the World Bank Group is not just to do loans and business every day, but to continue uh, to draw on that experience, um, compare it with other learning, and try to see how we can upgrade and provide additional insight. And in that sense, uh, those challenges remain at the heart of what we need to do in a global crisis because part of the, uh, the issue for us is how do we customize uh, our services uh, for each of those, those groups and categories given the nature uh, of the problem that we're in. Um, obviously, uh, there's, there's ones that will rise in prominence. So I was talking with some of the Huntsman Fellows uh, uh, and Louder Fellows earlier today about the particular challenge in the area of trade of identifying the need for trade finance. Given the problems that, or the amount of, of largely government guaranteed debt in the developed world, this has presented a special problem for some of these rising economic powers uh, that otherwise would have had open opportunities for finance. So one of the challenges that uh, runs across all this for us at the World Bank Group is to try to be faster and more flexible in adapting to client needs and seeing how we can solve problems. Uh, at the same time, there's an ongoing uh, requirement to try to anticipate, and we can get into this further with your questions or others. I think we are in a period now of uh, extraordinary uncertainty in the world economy. It's a very dangerous period, a lot of risk to the downside. So as a public institution, what we have to try to do while serving clients is try to get a sense of those issues uh, that are immediately on the horizon and work with other parties because um, while the World Bank Group has some considerable resources given the challenge of this problems, our real uh, need is to try to figure out how we try to mobilize other players uh, in support of the things we're doing. Some of the things on your agenda presumably required funding and a lot of attention by you and the World Bank staff, and your attention is deflected from those issues. For example, we know that the Arab countries are having remarkably rapid increases in population and labor force. Uh, they've had some troubles liberalizing. But given the amount of time one has to spend on something like that compared to the fact that Eastern Europe is in a free fall, can you really pursue that as well? Well, Howard, I don't have to do it all myself. <laughs> <laughs> we have 15,000 people there. Right. Uh, so uh, in a sense, part of the challenge here uh, as organizational management and leadership is that in, to take your case of the, uh, the Arab world, um, we tried uh, over the course of the past 18 months to work with our Arab partners and try to identify some of the major challenges that they saw compared to with our own sense. They include issues of education to workforce, uh, 
uh, women in the labor force, uh, water resources. Uh, I was just at the Arab League summit in the middle of January. Those remain very, very vital issues. Now, uh, of course, you have to adjust about what resources they have to provide. And with many of the Arab countries, the role that the bank was playing was not a financing one. It was taking the experience and knowledge, and we were providing some of this as a fee for service business. Uh, so part of what we instituted or focused on when I came to the bank was trying to adjust our business model uh, for different needs. And so that flexibility uh, is actually something that gives us a strength at this point. Now, you mentioned Central and Eastern Europe. In the same vein, uh, we were talking beforehand, and I was asked which region I felt was probably uh, most exposed to this crisis. And I mentioned Central and Eastern Europe because it's a region that, over the past 20 years, has used trade, investment, movement of labor force, which leads to remittances to integrate with the international economy. Uh, but in that sense, it exposed itself to greater vulnerability than some other countries would that were shielded from the system. But it doesn't have some of the cushions that uh, one had in Western Europe or in North America or Japan. And in part, because a number of the countries were in transition to the Eurozone, you have this added danger of assets such as mortgages that may be in a foreign exchange, uh, in this case the euro or Swiss francs, that adds to some of the risks. So part of what we need to do at the bank is something that we were working with some of our partners at the European Bank for Reconstruction Development, the European Investment Bank, uh, just last week to try to put together a fund where we could try to support some of the key uh, Western European banks that provide a lot of the, the banking structure uh, and support uh, for Central and Eastern Europe. But this won't work unless the European governments also provide the overall uh, support and framework. And that's a challenge that you were probably just, for those of you that had time to read the newspapers, were reading about this week. Another thing which immediately pops up, and it's probably a touchy topic, is historically developing countries have been very uh, out of tune with the advice, both from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Their advice differs. The IMF is macro, the World Bank is micro. But on things like the desirability of import liberalization, are you now finding that some developing countries are saying, we don't want to liberalize. Look at what has happened in the world. We're not going to try emphasizing exports because our export markets of the OECD are falling apart. Well, one of the things that makes this a fascinating period and will be for graduating students, is uh, it's a time of great flux with these issues. And uh, given the diversity in the world, you get countries that are turning to different answers. So I was just reading as I was coming here, um, Ecuador is probably um, putting on some of the greatest import restrictions. And so it's one of the countries you see first moving to protectionism. Um, I don't think that will succeed. Um, uh, we'll see over time. But interestingly enough, I got a similar report uh, from one of my colleagues that was just uh, in East Asia. And some of the East Asian countries were actually recognizing this may be a time to continue to move forward with reforms to try to achieve greater flexibility of markets. So to come back to the role of the bank, um, what we're trying to do is to focus on some of the lessons learned from the 97, 98 crisis and elsewhere and help clients uh, try to deal most efficiently and effectively with what are probably the primary needs. One is safety net systems, uh, particularly given what I believe will be the depth and length of this crisis. Uh, in all developing countries, one needs to be able to use resources effectively to deal with those that can least help themselves. Now, um, you know, if in some countries, there's about 10 or 12, starting with Mexico and Brazil, that develop something called conditional cash transfer programs which are programs that devote uh, cash resources to those that have been selected as being most in need. And the conditions are you need to send your children to school and you need to get basic health checkups. And that's been particularly helpful for uh, maternal health. Those programs are well designed to be able to uh, increase the amount of resources, expand the scope. But in some countries in sub-Saharan Africa, you don't have the organizational capacity. So there we're trying to learn what's worked with food for work programs, or school feeding programs, or school feeding programs that would bring some food home for the parents as well. Um, and so part of what the policy advice is, 
if you have limited resources but you want to help those in most in need, you probably don't want to increase all civil service salaries or uh, try to increase an overall wage structure because that's an inefficient way. So part of what we can share is the expertise. Now a second area, uh, learning from the Chinese experience in 97, 98, uh, is that countries can wisely invest in infrastructure to both create jobs and create a basis for future productivity, which is what China very much did. Now, this doesn't always have to be in hard infrastructure. There's various types of soft infrastructure. And one of the points we've been making to the Chinese, actually, that have a lot of hard infrastructure is this might be a time to invest in some of the soft infrastructure. Uh, and this includes some areas of educational and, and additional social development. Um, the third area that we're trying to encourage is the small and medium enterprise sector. Uh, because it's easy in an environment like this where you get big public responses to lose the fact that the greatest engine of creativity and flexibility in job creation is the small private sector, but they're often on the short end of the credit uh, stream. And so what can we do with microfinance and others to be able to keep that go uh, section going? Now, the reality is you know, in each country we have to customize based on the circumstances uh, and their own history and their own support. Uh, I mean, one of the hard lessons of development over the decades is Outsiders can't do it for a country. A country has to be able to own it. They have to be able to have a sense of, of, uh, of control over the project. And to give you a very practical example on that, uh, this week I was talking with the president of Ukraine and the prime minister of Ukraine shortly beforehand. The first challenge is to get them working closely together to get some IMF program. But in the process of offering what people call budget support, some basic financing, I was trying to suggest that um, we had some experience with some programs to try to help those most in need, and this could be both good politics and good economics. So in a crisis like this, part of the challenge would be issues of political economy. How do you get people to the right policy solution, recognizing the institution and political structure? And one of the challenges for us as, a, as the World Bank Group uh, is that uh, we have many fine economists and analysts, some of what, whom you've worked with over the years, but we also need to try to make sure that the analysts see themselves as problem solvers with this broader uh, complexion of, of political and social issues. And one final question before we turn it over. Um, the poorest countries in the world, the ones that have had slowest growth, have been the African ones. And from roughly 2002 to 2007, there were a number of about 18 African countries that were actually growing quite well. And now one senses that with commodity price decline, collapse in some cases, the African countries are having enormous problems and they're going to have increasingly bad problems as the OECD countries slow up and as China and India demand for exports from them go down. Is there any prospect that the bank could redeploy efforts towards the African countries? Let me start uh, with the foundation that you referred to because many people don't recognize some of the success of African development in recent years. If you go back uh, over about the past decade and you look at some uh, 17 countries that represent a little bit over a third of the population without mineral resources, uh, that group of countries grew on average about 5.6%. Uh, then there were about eight countries uh, that were the prime energy producers, uh, and, over that, and they represented a little bit less than a third of the population. That group um, grew at about an average of 7.2%. So you have about two-thirds of the population of Africa growing in a pretty significant range. Now, the problem in part was the missing third, and this is one of the issues going back to your first question of post-conflict and fragile states, and one of the tragedies of those countries is not only the harm that they cause their own people, but often their neighbors. And you know, we now have the statistical evidence that if you, one country is next to a post-conflict state, on average, your growth is about 1.2% less. One thing that would be a great tragedy of this crisis is that if people lose the sense of Africa's potential. and. Uh, having worked with Africa over the years, one of the things that I found very striking in recent years was a, a changed attitude among many African leaders of thinking solely of, of a social development agenda and in a sense being wards of the international system and instead wanting to have 
uh, frankly, what people in Western Europe wanted to have 50 years ago. They wanted to have regional integration linked to global markets, they wanted energy and infrastructure, and they wanted a healthy private sector. Now, in this, this crisis, uh, what that suggests to me is uh, one immediate aspect is you want to direct attention uh, to those who have been the good reformers. So uh, in a sense, you have a version of the Central and Eastern European problem. Some of those that are most linked to the international system could be made particularly vulnerable. Now, you mentioned commodity prices. Separately, uh, one of the things that we began at the World Bank, and I actually was at a discussion on it this morning with a, our extractive industries group, is how for, for, the, for the natural resource producers, the real challenge was one of governance. How do you take the resources, and Paul Collier and some others have written about this, build transparency in the system, build broad-based development, um, and in this current environment, uh, this group that we were meeting with this morning, was seeing that uh, if you believe, as I do, that at some point uh, you will have a recovery, and for various reasons I could see that commodity prices will rise again, you actually want to be putting in place the platform now um, so you don't have um, the great volatility and everything from property rights to laws to the contracts. Um, and it's not only a question of investor government confidence, but it's also a question of developing the benefits for the larger population so that uh, it's socially sustainable and politically sustainable. So part of the challenge of any policy job and a development job is how do you combine the near-term challenge uh, with looking a little bit further out? And I would argue that in the case of Africa, while you do want to provide uh, targeted assistance, for example, in social safety net, you don't want to lose the opportunity to build the future basis for growth. And that actually brings me back to the point about infrastructure and productivity basis. Again, there's a tremendous opportunity, and this is one of the things we were talking about with regional integration. If we can bring some of the smaller markets together, uh, relying on whether it be transport structure, use of the waterways, some of the energy systems, you know, one could come out of this crisis with investments that would actually create uh, the basis for future growth. So, you know, one of the challenges, uh, whether for me as a international policymaker or those at the national level, is to try to keep the eye on on those steps, uh, whether it'll be how you deal with future or the current liquidity and danger of future inflation, um, how you deal with the uh, 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 large expansion of, of expenditure and budget deficits, uh, at the same time that you're trying to cope with today's problem. Um, Bob, I, I've been, been sitting here listening, and you used the word crisis 17 times, but recovery only once. So my question is, as Janice said, you talk about a economic crisis, a financial crisis, an unemployment crisis, even perhaps a social and, um, and human crisis. What milestones or um, metrics ought, should we be looking at that's going to signal a recovery? Well, and I'll add one more that I've added since that piece. Well, oh, it's a political crisis. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, as you could tell, a little bit, my background is a little bit of mixture of economics and law and governance in different fields. And so I, I tend to look at these issues from a sort of multidisciplinary perspective. Um, and uh, no reason people would be aware of this, but when I was um, in the State Department from 89 to 92, I worked on German unification, all the events of the Cold War. So when I look at the issues of Central and Eastern Europe now, it's a very striking effect because I think of the danger of reversal of what was, I think, a historic global achievement in trying to unite Europe whole and free. Um, so in terms of, of what I would look at, um, I guess first uh, I, would, I would keep an eye on what's going to happen with the with stimulus programs. You've had a number of them start, as we were talking about before. I think actually the state of the art of knowing um, exactly what are the right tools or things that people have to approach with a certain humility. But there are certain ones still in the process, like looks like China's moving towards a second phase. Um, second, and I think this is critically important, uh, stimulus programs will be like a sugar high unless you fix the banking system. I mean, you'll get a surge, uh, but in, and uh, I'm sure none of you 
uh, in your circumstance, either drink a lot of coffee or eat chocolate or anything like that. But <laughs> you kind of get this high and then blam, you hit it to the ground. Um, and what Dominique Strauss-Kahn of the IMF has talked about is they've analyzed some 122 financial crises. And unless you fix the banking and financial system, you can't get it back going. And so I think the core issue, not only for the United States now, but for others, is how do you deal with this conundrum of cleaning up the bad assets and recapitalizing the banks? Um, a third question uh, is uh, to keep a watch, and, and again, I think in this area, I think the United States, through the Federal Reserve, has been pretty creative, is how do you keep some of the credit markets working? Right now, the banking system doesn't provide that. The Federal Reserve has actually used its balance sheet to provide a secondary market by buying commercial paper and mortgages and other assets. I personally think that it would be useful for some of the other central banks globally to look at that uh, more closely as, as a tool to use. But I do see potential downside risks. And, and so in the anticipatory sign, uh, one that I have a concern about is something that happened in 97 and 98, hasn't happened yet, uh, which would be the collapse of a major currency. You've had depreciation, significant depreciation, but you haven't had a currency really come down. Now, as a policymaker, Knowing that, that's one of the reasons why I believe that the calls for the IMF to double its resources are very important, so it would have the resources to be able to intervene and support, again, the role of anticipation. Um, a second area is uh, protectionism. Um, you know, probably all of you have read about Smoot-Hawley and what happened in the 30s and the traditional tariff forms of protectionism. That would be bad enough. Um, but, uh, frankly, there's a lot of uh, sort of insidious ways that you could start to take steps that start to uh, create counter reactions in other countries. And I just have to emphasize this as a former U.S. trade representative. People look at the U.S. and the biggest countries w under, under a very close uh, microscope. So when you saw this Buy America provision came in, uh, you know, fortunately it got some close attention, so people uh, made at least uh, what I, it appears to be some adjustments. But uh, as you look at these big pieces of legislation and stimulus passes, you've got to look closely at these to get a sense of some of the trade effects. The WTO, which doesn't have this capability, actually recently asked us to try to uh, examine some of the stimulus packages. Uh, and even though it'll be sensitive in some quarters, I think it's a good idea to try to uh, identify these topics. Then there's uh, an aspect of, um, of, of political economy that I don't know how to describe other than the fact that it's a global crisis, you need a global solution. That means countries have to cooperate. And uh, one of the dangers as we get further into increasing unemployment rates is do you start to see actions that show countries pointing fingers at one another as opposed to uh, trying to work together? And I think that's something that I would watch very closely during the course of 2009. You know, as, as a leader of one of the international institutions, you know, I can try to play a modest role in identifying these, but uh, part of the challenge in this whole system is, you know, we still have an economy based on nation states. That's the political basis. Those are where the decisions are made. People have to be responsible for their local citizenry. But the issues that we're dealing with are certainly cross-border and transnational. So how do you uh, interconnect those two? Looking a little further ahead, uh, we talked about this this afternoon in this anticipatory spirit. Uh, one would certainly want to be alert to the fact that there's a lot of liquidity out there. And at some point when um, the velocity of money picks up, you could have an inflationary uh, boom and bust again. And so I think the good news is the Fed and the European Central Bank have identified that. They've suggested how they would withdraw the liquidity, but as in a lot of things in life, timing is everything. So knowing when and how to do it is still going to be a big issue. And if you had to design it, what would the post-crisis world look like? Or if you could design <laughs> it? <laughs> well, I... Um, it, it's hard because I'm trying to think of uh, sort of the practical reality versus what I would wish. Um, I guess I would say this uh, at, a, at this general level. Um, I believe that globalization has brought a lot of benefits uh, to people and that you know, I've been in a lot of developing countries where I've seen the incredible opportunity it's provided not only economically but in terms of openness and freedom. I think it would be a huge tragedy if that were lost and reversed. But from the start of my period at the bank, I felt that to sustain globalization, uh, one has to uh, make it both inclusive and I use the term sustainable.
inclusive within countries so that you get a broader sense of benefits of it, but also across countries. And then sustainable has both the environmental meaning, but also it has a systemic meaning. How do you try to learn some of the lessons uh, from what happened in financial markets, try to see how you can head them off? Um, how do you try to uh, strengthen some of the disciplines in, in, in the trading system and sort of move the, the bias towards uh, freer trade? Uh, and so what I hope will come out of this is a recognition that um, many of the forces that have created incredible economic opportunity over the 50, past 50 years uh, remain very valuable. You don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but you have to create some changes in the institutional structure. And here again, this affects the institution uh, that I had, the World Bank. I don't know how it is now in courses. I remember when I was taking courses, you know, we read about the creation of the multilateral institutions. You know, so these are the grand old institutions that were created in 1944 and 45. Not surprisingly, public institutions uh, often change more slowly than private institutions do. So frankly, coming back to the mission of the World Bank Group, part of our challenge is how do we overhaul and update these institutions to play a role? Some of that can happen in crises. Sometimes crises can be an opportunity to move. I mean, it's useful to remember that the World Bank and the IMF were created while World War II was still going on. So those people were kind of busy doing something, but they took time to deal with these institutions. So you can walk and chew gum at the same time. But I do think sometimes uh, whenever you have an event like we've just are, are going through, sometimes you also have uh, uh, so political responses that uh, can overreact. And there you have to figure through um, whether you might do more damage, you know. So just one to, to flag is, is that obviously there needs to be lessons for uh, regulatory reforms. Um, there were lessons of excess. But one has to be careful in the present environment that if you want to get the private sector back engaged, uh, that you don't uh, undermine further confidence in the private sector. So those are some of the balances people have to strike. 